Prince of Nightmares Written by John McNee Narrated by John McNee I lay me here to sleep. No nightmare shall plague me until they swim all the waters that flow upon the earth and count all the stars that appear in the firmament. Thus help me, God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Traditional German Charm Against Nightmares Prologue Sweet dreams, her mother said, turning out the light. Left alone to ponder the darkness, the girl didn't fret and didn't cry, but she didn't go to sleep. Though she was very young, too young to understand her mother's instructions, she seemed never to sleep. She lay on her back in the crib, content to watch the shadows on the ceiling and wait patiently for something to happen. For an hour or more she lay like that, though she was too young yet to appreciate the passage of time. Outside the evening was a peaceful one, without even enough wind to shake the branches of the trees. Inside the house was at rest, and silence reigned. Until the music began. Had she been able to lie another hour in the dark, listening only to the sound of her own breathing, she might well have slept. Eventually. The music dashed all hopes of that. She lifted her head at the cheerful strumming of a guitar, stood as the rest of the band joined in, and, at the sound of two pairs of feet dancing across the floorboards, pitched herself over the side of the crib. She landed with a bump and was straight up onto her feet, toddling out through the door and down the hall, following the tune's echo to the bottom of the stairs, where a silver-plated, leather-lined wheelchair sat empty and abandoned. On hands and knees she crawled up to the first-floor landing, following the music to the library. A man was singing, his voice distorted by the vintage of the recording, though she was too young to understand the words. Clinging to the door frame, keeping herself hidden, she peered in and saw a tall old man dressed in tweed in the arms of a young, red-headed woman in a floral print dress. They grinned at each other, dancing across the open floor. Behind them, seated in a wide circle, surrounded by mirrors, were ten or twelve others, among them her mother. They all laughed as the couple danced. They applauded. She was too young to make sense of the scene, too young to understand why they clapped their hands together, why the old man wept and cried out, Thank you, Evelyn! Thank you so much! Looking past them, into the mirror's reflections, she caught sight of a figure. None of the others seemed to see him, all too wrapped up in the dancing, laughing, weeping and applause. She was the only one and he stared back. A thin man of sharp black shadow and smiling red eyes, he returned her gaze, regarding her with a warm familiarity that put her at ease instantly. And though she was very young, too young to understand very much at all, she understood him. Chapter 1 The Gunshot When It Came was not quite loud enough to shock Victor out of his phone conversation. He jumped at the sound of the muffled pop from the bathroom, turning his head towards the locked door. But his concentration didn't waver. The steering group will need to see a report, he said. Something substantial, before money changes hands. They want bribes is what they want. Edward's anxious voice echoed down the line from London, some 10,000 miles away. Let's not be coy about this. Nonsense, said Victor, his gaze still on the bathroom door, eyes narrowed, wondering what it was he'd just heard. They just need a few pages of crap to wade through, a few graphs. Surely Josie had heard it too. Edward, can I call you back? They want to see something now, Edward answered. This week, and I'm in no position. I'm flying to Munich on Tuesday. Victor raised himself slowly from the bed, eyes on the door searching the wall for answers, wondering what could have made a sound like that. Edward, call Crawford. He'll be at the conference. He can help you. Slater will have his number. Calford? No, Crawford, Victor snarled, fingers tightening around the receiver, eager to be free. C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D. Ask Slater. I have to go now. All right, then. Thank you, Mr. Tev. 
he slammed the receiver down and crossed towards the bathroom door. It was all over, and had been since the shot had sounded. There was nothing he could have done in those few moments, no way to help. But in the months to come, the memory of those seconds frittered away on meaningless conversation would haunt him. The bathroom door wasn't locked. It clicked open at his touch. Josie's name was on his lips, but he never got it out. The smell stifled any words, the fierce odour of burnt cordite, and something more. He leaned around the door, his mind's eye already two jumps ahead, telling him what he would discover. There would be no surprises here. Blood was spattered on the inside of the shower curtain. When he cast his mind back to the discovery, he wouldn't remember crossing from the door to the bathtub, but he must have run, because in a flash he was there, hand gripping the curtain and tearing it back, revealing her as she'd wanted him to see her, as she'd wanted him to remember her. A glorious, gore-slicked disgrace, a hideous jumble of pale, bony limbs and blood, sickening in its lack of dignity, to be forever seared upon his memory. The brand of a vicious and spiteful lover. She still clung to the revolver with both hands, the edge of the gun barrel lodged between her teeth. Smoke spiralled upward from the jagged cavity at the back of her skull. Victor could hear the shot now, he realised. Over and over again it thundered in his head. And a voice. Her voice? His own? No. Don't be stupid, he told himself. The phantom gunshots were fists pounding on the hotel room door. The voice was Harry's. A moment later, someone from hotel security slid their card into the lock, and they all came piling in to find what he had found, and the man himself, old and broken. He was crouched at the side of the tub, looking like he might never find the strength to lift himself back to his feet, and was reaching out with one liver-spotted hand towards his dead wife, unable to bring himself to touch her. Oh no, said Harry finding the words that Victor could not. He turned slowly, expecting to meet the man's gaze, but saw Harry was not looking at him, nor at Josie's corpse. His eyes were on the mirror, drawing Victor's attention to the last horror in the room, the suicide note he'd failed to see. It was scrawled in her lipstick. God forgive me. I married an evil man. Chapter 2 A tap on the window roused him from a dreamless sleep. Victor, wake up, we're here! He blinked the smudges from his sight and cringed, cursing himself for drifting off. Dozing in the back of cars, even Bentley's, was bad for his joints. He could feel the familiar stiffness creeping its way into his knees and neck muscles, even as he tossed Private Eye out of his lap and reached for his walking cane. You shouldn't have let me sleep! He growled as he stepped out. I was driving, said Harry. There had been no need in Harry coming along all the way from Sydney, babysitting him on two flights and acting as chauffeur the last one hundred miles. Victor had told him so, but Harry insisted. He found his footing on the gravel and squinted up the sloping hill to the Ballador House Hotel. It was a handsome Gothic building characterised by turrets, bay windows and stained glass but undeniably modest. It's not a castle, is it? said Harry. I was expecting a castle. It is what it is, Victor muttered, turning away. He looked across the car park to the lock, silver and still in the early evening breeze. I'll take the bags in, Harry said. Do that, Victor said, starting downhill towards the water. I'll join you in a minute. The sun was white, and small in the west, but still just visible under a veil of grey cloud. Victor clutched at the collar of his overcoat and took a lungful of cool air, hoping it and the silence might flush some of the clutter from his head. There were no boats on the water, no people on the pebble shore. The hills on the other side of the loch were pale purple shadows, showing no signs of life. It felt like he was a very long way from civilization. He entered the lobby to find Harry arguing with the woman at the desk. 
Well, it's not acceptable, he was saying, sounding like the definitive loudmouth yank abroad. You're supposed to be running a professional business. Someone reserves a room, you hold it for them. You don't just give it away when you feel like it. I wouldn't think I'd have to explain that to a hotel manager. Well, no, of course, and I do apologize. I never imagined there would be a problem. The woman had a helmet of orange hair that looked tough enough to smash glass. On her tartan jacket was a gold name tag that read, Shona Dempsey, manager. What's going on? Victor asked. She's given your room away, Harry said. His face was flushed, which happened with alarming speed whenever he got upset about something. Even his eyes, behind the thick tortoise-shell glasses, looked red. Not given away, exactly, the manager protested. We have two suites. Circumstances required that I swap reservations so that another guest moved into your suite and you took theirs. So, Victor said. Harry stamped his finger on the counter. Mrs. Teversham, the late Mrs. Teversham, specifically requested the library suite. The amenities are the same, she said. There's no difference in price. I don't understand, Victor interjected. What sweet would I be getting? Harry shot a challenging glare to the manager. She hesitated, looking back and forth between the pair, before admitting, The honeymoon suite. Ah, Victor said. Suddenly it all made sense. Do you have any idea who this man is? Harry snapped, building to another rant. Decades spent travelling the globe in the employ of Victor Teversham had dulled the edges of his accent, but it reaffirmed itself with vigour when he got mad. You'd physically have to have your head stuck up your ass not to have the faintest inkling of what he's had to endure these... Harry, Victor said. Forget it, it's fine. It's not fine, Harry barked, then hushed when he realised how much noise he was making. The argument had turned the heads of more than one customer in the bar area. Victor, it's not fine, he whispered. It's the honeymoon suite. It's just a room, Harry, Victor said, wanting an end to the conversation. Four walls and a bed. It doesn't matter. Victor, it doesn't matter. He approached the desk. Is there something I need to sign? The manager nodded stiffly and put some papers before him. I'll need the card that was used to make the reservation. My wife's card, Victor said, opening his wallet. Here's mine. You're aware of what a stay here entails, aren't you? You know of our reputation, she asked, as she handed his card back to him. Harry snorted derisively. Yes, Victor said. I've been told all about it. Okay, she said, and reached for another piece of paper. Then... I also have to ask you to sign this. It just protects us against any litigation in the event of any psychological or physical trauma. Don't sign that, Harry said. Don't sign a damn thing. Again, he turned on the manager. Nothing on your website said anything about signing any waivers. What kind of bullshit scam are you trying to run? I... The woman stammered. I, I just... It's... Victor scratched his name across the page. Just give me the key. Mrs. Dempsey took the waiver and smiled curtly, but neglected to make eye contact with either man as she filed it and went through to the office. Victor, Harry pressed in towards him, speaking in conspiratorial tones. Are you absolutely sure about this? Victor sighed. How many more times do you think you're going to ask me that? Mrs. Dempsey returned with the keys and waved them towards the stairs. Right this way, gentlemen. The two suites took up the whole of the country house's first floor. The library suite comprised the rooms at the rear of the house, facing the trees, while Victor's quarters looked out across the lock. A brass plate on the door confirmed it as the honeymoon suite, in delicately engraved script, but inside there were thankfully few reminders of its romantic status. The suite included a large dining room with a carved fireplace and turreted dining area, adjoining a king-sized bedroom and ensuite bathroom. It was warmly furnished throughout in antique oak and tweed, and Victor felt willing to concede that under different circumstances he'd probably have found it all quite charming. Harry gazed out at the lock. Not exactly Miami Beach, but I guess it's okay. Victor shook off his coat and hung it up. 
It'll do. Honeymoon suite, Harry sneered. What's a place like this need a honeymoon suite for anyway? Who seriously wants to spend their honeymoon in a haunted house? Victor sniffed and shrugged. There are some strange people in the world, I suppose. You're right about that. I think I saw a few in the lobby. Harry turned away from the window and surveyed the room. You want me to help you unpack? I'm not a bloody child, Harry. I didn't say you were, he protested. I can unpack my own bloody suitcases, okay? You've done more than enough. More than I ever needed or expected you to. Clearly. Victor sighed. I'm not having a go, all right? You're upset about the woman at the desk, aren't you? I can go talk to her if you want and smooth things over. No, no, Victor said. I can do that. You need to get a move on. It'll be dark soon. Right, Harry hesitated. Of course. I could always ask if there are any rooms free, without ghosts. No. Or there was a motel we passed just before the bridge. I would be just up the road. No, no, don't degrade yourself on my account, please. I don't like leaving you here on your own. I want to be on my own. He was shouting now. Don't you get it? I need to be on my own. It's not right, Victor. It's not healthy. Jesus Christ, not again, he moaned. Not this again. Again? I've been biting my damn tongue since Stansted. I'm not going to kill myself, he yelled. I'm not waiting for you to leave so I can tie a rope around my neck. I'm not going to slash my throat with a razor and I'm not about to swallow a bunch of pills and go walking into the lake. I just want to be alone. There are better places for grieving. Victor gave a bitter laugh as he collapsed into one of the armchairs, as though the argument was physically exhausting him. Don't talk to me about grief. She wanted it this way. For better or worse, she chose this. That makes it the best chance I have at understanding. Harry shook his head. You won't find any answers here, Victor. He closed his eyes and felt the pain behind them. Maybe not. But at least it'll get me away from you for a little while, eh? He smiled. Come on. You must need a vacation as badly as me. When's the last time you had four whole days away from my ugly face? Harry did his best to return the smile, but it still came off a little half-hearted. I honestly can't remember. He was quieter now, like a dog that had been brought to heel. Victor clapped his hand on the armrest of his chair. There you are, you see. Likely do us both a bit of good. It's been so long, I don't know what to do with myself. Treat it as a learning experience. We both can. Yeah, I guess. Harry nodded, satisfied there was nothing more he could say. You got your cell phone? Victor chuckled. No, Harry, I don't have my cell phone. Oh, Victor, come on. No. There was a time before bloody cell phones, Wi-Fi, satellite television, and all the other feckless distractions of the world. You may not remember it, but I do, and I bloody well long for it. That's what I want. So no, I don't have my cell, but you know where I am if you need to reach me, and I have your number if I absolutely have to call you. He gave the other man a hard glare. I won't call you. Please try not to call here. Harry nodded. Well, see you in four days, I guess. All right. Victor didn't rise from his chair. Instead, he turned his head towards the window staring out at the ashen sky. See you then. Harry walked out of the suite and closed the door behind him. He strolled down the stairs and straight out through the main doors, pausing only briefly in the lobby near a rack of brochures and guidebooks. He pocketed one on his way out, a narrow digest with a glossy maroon cover and raised black title that read History of Ballador House. Chapter 3 He was alone. He remained in the chair for close to an hour, watching the sky like a sheet of stretched grey plastic gradually darkening as the sun sank behind the hills. He heard the pop of gravel in the drive as Harry departed, and he could hear the faint sounds of other guests in other rooms or making their way up or down the stairs. Eventually, though, all he could hear was the sound of his own breath and the soft thump of his own heart in his chest. 
he was alone. It was, he realised, the first time he'd been alone, properly, since Josie's death. The last time might even have been years or decades before that. Wherever he'd gone or whatever he'd done, she had been there. And if not her, then Harry or any dozen of his other flunkies. No matter what he was doing, there was always another meeting to get to, another phone call to take, another mess to clean up, another policeman to pay off, politician to flatter, or journalist to intellectually eviscerate. Never a moment to himself. In the weeks following Josie's death, the calls, texts and emails had thinned out, but there always seemed to be people in the room. At home, the only time Harry or the housekeeping staff let him be was when he was sleeping or defecating. This was different. Quite different. Victor rose from the chair and went into the bedroom. A dressing table with a large mirror stood against one wall. He crept towards it, regarding his haggard reflection like a wild, wounded animal. He made for a sorry sight. His body was thin yet sagging and already bearing the hunch of a drying spine. His skin had the pallor of cheap putty, a consequence of living too long in England, and looked much like it had been stretched across his skull by a crazed toddler, pulled too tight across his forehead and cheeks, but hanging in wrinkled bunches under his chin. Dry white hair sprouted proudly around his ears and the back of his neck, but nowhere else on his head, while his watery blue eyes peered grimly out of dark, sunken sockets. He'd clothed his aching limbs in a pressed white shirt and charcoal suit, rumpled and musty from travelling, and finished with a plain black tie. Regarding himself now, he saw a frail old man, dressed as though for his own funeral. Stop it, he said, shaking the morbid thought from his head. He undid the tie as he reached for the nearest suitcase. He changed, putting on a pair of corduroy trousers, green knitted jumper and brown brogues. Not the most remarkable of transformations, perhaps, but he felt better about his reflection when he checked the mirror again. He thought of splashing some water over his face, but hesitated on his way to the ensuite, and doubled back into the sitting room. He picked up his cane on the way out the door and headed down to the lobby. The manager was still behind the desk when he arrived at the bottom of the stairs. She was reading something from a stack of forms and looked to be typing it into the computer. If Victor had wanted to, he could have probably walked right by without her noticing, but that would only have prolonged the inevitable. Pardon me, he said as timidly as he could. I just wanted to apologise for my friend's behaviour earlier. It was uncalled for. Mrs. Dempsey raised her head and, for the briefest moment, flashed a look that was hard rage. It softened in the next instant to be replaced by gentle affability. It's really quite all right, Mr. Teversham. The fault was mine. Whether there was any fault or not is irrelevant. His tone and comments were entirely unacceptable. She smiled. Oh, I've had to deal with a lot worse, believe me. You quickly get used to it doing this job. Unruly guests? A few. Our reputation attracts the occasional odd sort. Quite a few odd sorts, if I'm honest. You'll probably meet some of them. They can be keen to swap stories of the things they've seen, and equally keen to apportion blame when they see something they don't like. Oh, come now, he said. Can it really be that bad? She shrugged with her eyebrows, the kind of expression that said, You don't know what you're letting yourself in for, and I've no way of communicating it. Put it this way, she said, I've slept here only once. That was ten years ago, and it'll be another hundred before I do it again. He didn't have a reply to that. He stared at her for a few seconds with his mouth slightly open, trying to gauge if she was joking. Finally, still undecided, he said, I was going to inquire about getting something to eat. Ah, yes, the woman's tone and expression brightened remarkably. Our restaurant is straight through the lounge, or, if you'd prefer, an order can be made straight to your suite. The restaurant sounds preferable. Very good. She logged out of the hotel computer and rounded the desk. I'll take you through. She led him into the lounge, 
decorated in more oak panelling and mercifully muted shades of tartan, and past the bar, through French doors, into the living room. Dinner is served from five until ten, she said, but the bar is open twenty-four hours with a limited menu if you should find yourself peckish in the night. I wouldn't have thought there were enough guests to merit that, Victor said. We may not have a great number, but the ones we do have can be prone to restless nights. We like to provide a comfortable area where they can come, relax, have a drink and share stories, whatever the hour. Personally, I think it's worth it. Many have said so. But you'll find all that out for yourself, I'm sure. She gave him another smile laced with friendly malevolence and motioned to a waiter. Mr. Tevisham of the Honeymoon Suite, she said, when the young man approached. For dinner. The waiter, a tall, thin lad not quite out of his teens, with bleach-blond hair and an earring through his eyebrow, nodded and escorted Victor to a table by the window, thankfully making no inquiries as to whether his wife would be joining him. Can I get you something to drink? Ginger ale for now, Victor said. No ice. The pierced waiter left him to peruse the menu and wine list. Victor surveyed the room. Of the ten or so tables, only three were occupied, including his. At the one farthest away sat a middle-aged couple, quietly sipping soup without looking each other in the eye. On Victor's right, against the opposite wall, another man was dining alone. He looked only ten or fifteen years younger than Victor, dressed in a checkered suit and bow tie. Victor couldn't identify what the man was eating. Some kind of obscure meat dish. He scanned his own menu. Breast of Scottish wood pigeon, rouge foie gras, veal sweetbreads. There was no shortage of contenders. When he glanced up, he saw that the man was staring at him. He had wide, pale eyes, accentuated by the deep tan of his skin. Victor immediately looked away, turning his attention back to the menu. He could tell, however, that the other guest had not turned away. The eyes were still on him. He could feel them. Ginger ale, the waiter said, announcing his return and setting the glass down. Are you ready to order? Yes, I think so. Victor ordered a Roquefort salad followed by venison Wellington. The only Pinot Noir on the wine list was from New Zealand, but he grit his teeth and ordered a bottle anyway. The waiter nodded, gathered the menus and started back to the kitchen. When he stepped away, the man at the other table returned to his peripheral vision. Victor was well used to being stared at. People didn't fawn over him the way they might a film star or pop singer, but he had, in his life, managed to achieve a certain level of notoriety. This had spiked in recent weeks with Josephine's death and its investigation, making international headlines. He was well practised in the art of ignoring rubberneckers. He'd come prepared for it. Yet, there was something about this character that unsettled him. He turned his head towards the window. He gazed at the newer part of the hotel, which was built in the 90s. As he understood it, those six rooms weren't afflicted with the same phenomenon that supposedly blighted his, meaning the Ballador was at least halfway able to operate as a mainstream tourist destination. The architects had taken great care imitating the style of the original design, and the materials looked very close, but a shrewd eye could easily tell where the old joined the new. Beyond this was a well-maintained lawn with a few shrubs and flower beds, then woodlands, and beyond that more hills, their crests just visible against the darkening sky. He turned back just as the first drops of rain began to patter against the glass. The tanned man's eyes were still on him. It suddenly occurred to Victor that the man was wearing mascara, the same boot-polished shade as the hair he'd combed taut over his scalp, and shaved into a pencil-thin moustache above his lips. Those lips! Victor glanced down to his ginger ale, focusing on its carbonated bubbles. He raised it to his mouth, closing his eyes as he took a long sip. He kept them closed as he lowered the glass to the table, clenched and unclenched his fists, sucked a deep breath in through his mouth, let it out through his nostrils. Those lips! Finally, his eyes snapped open, and he turned them on the other diner, delivering a good, hard glare. The gentleman gave no sign of embarrassment or even acknowledgement. He held Victor's gaze. 
Victor squinted, focusing his attention on the man's mouth and confirming his suspicions. He was wearing lipstick, pink, with a wet gloss finish. As Victor stared, the ends of his pink lips curled upwards into an incomprehensible smile. Victor responded the only way he knew how. He rose from his chair, stormed across the room towards the other man's table, then continued straight out through the door. On reflection, I think I'm a little more tired than I first realised, he told Mrs Dempsey when he reached the front desk. I'll take dinner in my suite. Certainly, sir. I'll inform the kitchen. He trudged wearily back up the stairs, trying to shake the image of the pink-lipped man out of his head. He had anticipated there would be strange characters here. What he hadn't expected was just how uncomfortable he could be made to feel in their presence. He'd thought himself much tougher to rattle. Arriving on the first floor, he tried his key in the lock and found it wouldn't fit. He sighed, tried it again, tugged at the handle, slammed his palm against the door and failed to move it a millimeter. It was only when he took a step back that he realized he was standing outside the wrong suite. He heard someone moving inside, and before he could flee, the door was thrown open. The brunette who emerged was young, beautiful, and visibly outraged. Victor saw her bare feet first, and even they looked angry. Raising his head, he quickly took in her long legs, short satin nightgown, and fair freckled face, framed by a tousled mess of brown hair. Her features were screwed up in fury, a French curse word on the tip of her tongue. Yet when her eyes met Victor's, they popped wide. Her jaw dropped and she jerked back, slamming the door in his face before he could muster anything approaching an apology. S sorry he said, directing his apology to the brass plate that read, The Library Suite. Though embarrassment had slightly dented his appetite, he made it to the end of his meal, enjoyed in relative tranquility. A large flat-screen television was concealed in a cabinet in the living room, but he consciously ignored it. It was tempting to seek distractions from his own thoughts, but that would contradict his entire purpose in coming to the hotel. So he ate accompanied by the sound of the rain, which lasted only until the end of his second course. When he was done, he put the tray on the sideboard outside his door, casting a nervous glance at the door to the other suite across the landing, and prepared for bed. Again he slowed as he neared the ensuite, trying to block unpleasant thoughts and images from creeping into his mind, but not quite succeeding. The journey brought the memories rushing back. His footsteps were so much like the steps he'd taken that night. Standing at the bathroom's door felt like standing at an aeroplane's hatch, stealing himself to take a leap into the void. With heavy breaths he pushed the door open and turned on the light. The ensuite was tiled in white and blue with old-fashioned porcelain fittings. The bathtub was on his right, half hidden by an opaque plastic shower curtain. Of course it was. He felt dizzy and weak as he reached his hand out towards it, gripped and peeled it back to reveal what he already knew he'd find. Nothing. It didn't matter. He saw her there anyway. <laughs>